Welcome to Heine House Live, a podcast about the exciting and ever-changing world of gaming and technology. Heine House Live is available on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever else you listen to podcasts. For all other info, including links to our community Discord, live video feed, episode archive, and a whole host of other great entertainment, please visit HeineHouse.com. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Ladies and gentlemen, hello. How are you doing? Welcome back to the Heidi House. Hey, I'm your host, Jason, hanging out with you tonight. Good day to you. Hope you're doing well. Hope uh, everything has gone fantastic this week. And uh, I hope that your next week is even better. Let's jump right in. I've got some amazing stuff on. In fact, I have a very action-packed episode for you today. Episode 3, not holding back, March 16th, 2019. I'm recording this in the evening. It's about 9 p.m. And I've got a lot to talk about, a lot of great stuff. I've got Discord audio questions. I've got text questions. I have tons of retro gaming uh, PC news. As you can see behind me, I've got some big box games. I'm going to talk about more big box games. i got a bunch here, uh, here to my left that I'll pull out and we'll talk about. Um, we've got a bunch of gaming news as well. Cloud gaming. Hello. It's like the cloud gaming wars that's happening right now. I'll get into all this. A lot of great stuff. Um, and then I'll also we'll do some uh, a, a hashtag event for everyone to get involved with. Uh, spoiler, hashtag retro PC is the hashtag if you want to jump in early and go have some fun with us in Discord. But if before I get into all this stuff, folks, I would like to sum up this episode. If you only listen to the first five minutes, I'm going to sum up the episode right now for you. Ready for this? Here we go. Windows 95. Windows NT workstation. Don't hear that one too much. Good old Windows 98. Remember that one? Ooh, Windows 2000 Pro. That one's nice. Good old classic XP, of course. Uh, Windows 10. <laughs> it's kind of boring, right? I mean, it's nice sounding, but uh, in comparison to the others, I mean, what's your favorite? I think, honestly, I think uh, Windows 98 or the, the Windows 2000, those are, those are really quite nice, really peaceful, quite tasty. I like that a lot. All right. So I've already talked a little bit about what we're going to be talking about in this episode. Tons and tons of great stuff. I'm not going to take too much time. I do want to jump right into it. But again, I want to go ahead with the opener and just let everyone know how to get involved with this podcast, Heine House Live. A lot of ways you can do it. If you're on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, at Heine House. And uh, if you want to submit an audio question, it's super easy to do. All you do is pull out your phone or you've got a microphone connected to your computer. Super easy. Pull up the voice app, record yourself, and then email it. Send it on over, HeineHouseLive at gmail.com. The homie Jim on Discord actually sent me a private message on Discord with an audio question. I'll take them that way, too. Whatever's more convenient for you. We'll get them on the show. So you can send them over on uh, Discord as well. You can uh, PM me there. And, of course, all the info, all this info is available at HeineHouse.com, the brand new HeineHouse.com website. Go check it out. A lot of fun there. You can connect with me and the entire amazing community. And lastly, of course, the show is 100% funded by your support on Patreon. Thank you so much for your continued support, all of you. This means so much. In fact, I'd like to welcome a couple more people onto Patreon. Welcome back, Mr. Sam Dutch, my man right there. Thank you so much for returning to Patreon. It's good to see you, and always a pleasure to have you. And of course, welcome Mr. Cliff Boyd. Mr. Cliff Boyd. Winner. Good to see you, sir. Thank you for joining and supporting uh, this content and my entertainment. It means so much to me. It really, really does. So thank you, gentlemen. You know, what's other, you know another fun thing you can do? And uh, this is all new. This is brand new. This is another piece of technology that's tons of fun. You have Internet of Things items in your house. And I don't want to say, but it's a, it's, a, it's a device from Google, and it's a device from uh, Amazon. 
And I don't want to say it out loud because it will trigger everyone's in the house. So I'll be very polite and I won't say it. I'll mute myself before I do. But you know what's really fun? You know who else really likes to listen to uh, this podcast? Yeah. Your Internet of Things devices that you have sitting in your house right now. You can just ask it. In fact, here, let me show you. Let's do it right now live on the spot. And I'm going to mute myself while I do this. Can you play the latest podcast episode from Jason Heine? I looked for podcast episode from Jason Heine, but it either isn't available or can't be played right now. Can you play Heine House Live? All right, resuming Heine House Live. Heine House Live, two Joy-Cons suck, foldable phones and PC gaming. All right, that works. Live video feed, episode archive, and a whole How about that? How about a great entertainment? Pause the podcast, please. So, let's say you have a device in your house. You can ask it to play the recent episode of Heine House Live. <laughs> it's funny that it actually pronounces my name the proper way. So, technically, my name is pronounced Heine, obviously German. Um... But for some odd reason down the road, long, long time ago, they converted it or just started to pronounce it Heine. And who knows? Probably was a joke or something. But I think, I, I mean, I love it. I mean, why not? I've built my whole brand around it, for fuck's sake. You know, I love it. So anyway, if you have something uh, like this device from Google A or maybe your your friend from Amazon or any anything else, uh, gosh, does Cortana even do that? Maybe, maybe Cortana does. But you can ask that device to play Heine House Live and boom. Just, just let it rock. Pretty fun. You can also do it in the car. Um, Apple CarPlay. Um, and uh, no, 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 it's not Apple CarPlay. What is it? It's, uh, yeah, Apple CarPlay and Android Auto is what it is. So you can ask it to do that in there as well. Okay, let's jump right in, folks. It is so fun. So much great stuff. I am a huge, most of you know that I'm a huge PC gamer. I've been following my PC gaming love for so many years. But if you haven't, I want to talk a little bit about uh, PC gaming, and then I want to go into um, all these games that I'm talking about and showing off. I think it's going to be a ton of fun. We can relive these memories and talk about all of that. But first, before I get into that, let's talk about some news. There's some gaming news that's been going on. Oh, my goodness. I have a lot to talk about. Random news here. The homie Digital Rhino posted in Discord a Lucky Charms cereal beer. Now, we're all gamers. We're all tech people. We all, you know, grew up in 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, you know, 2000s, what have you. But there was, there was a period of time where Saturday morning cartoons were the shit. I mean, this was like you'd wake up and you'd have your sort Saturday morning cartoons, and it was just unbelievable, amazing. And I remember vividly waking up, coming downstairs, having my cereal, uh, my mom would be like trying to comb my hair because it'd be all fucked up, you know, and I would be having cereal and I'd be having Lucky Charms or I'd be having Fruity Pebbles or my favorite Cinnamon Toast Crunch. I'd be having those. But what's happening now is that we have those children who are now my age or older uh, are starting to get that nostalgia bug and they're starting to to do things like barcades are popping up. And that's that's been a trend for quite some time uh, when we have uh well, why don't I just show you? We have this popping up right there. Saturday morning. It's called Saturday morning uh, from Smart Mouth Brewing. This is a Lucky Charms inspired beer. Yes, I know. I, I thought the same thing. How in the fuck does that taste good? I made some notes about it here. Saturday, it's inspired by, obviously, Lucky Charms. Saturday morning cartoons. And it's called, the beer itself is called, It's Magically Ridiculous. <laughs> yes, almost sounds right. Brewed by Smart Mouth Brewing. They're located in Virginia. It's infused, get this, infused with marshmallows that are toasted in-house, as well as the dehydrated marshmallow bits that you will find in your magically delicious cereal. They cannot say that they're from Lucky Charms, but they are, in fact, from that cereal. Wow. So you've got... You've got a beer that tastes like Lucky Charms with bits of toasted marshmallows and bits of dehydrated marshmallows. I don't know how that would taste. That's definitely uh, piqued my interest. 
But the Digital Rhino posted that for us there in the Discord. Thank you for that, sir. I would like to try it, to be honest. I don't drink. I'm not really a big drinker. I don't do a lot of beer. Honestly, I maybe drink maybe four or five times a year. I don't really drink that much. But I would be down to try it. I really would be. Um, there's some other stuff that's been going on. Um, let me jump right into some gaming news. Uh, because Stephanie and I have been going back to our NES Classic. And can I just say... Can I just say, the NES Classic and the Super Nintendo Classic, those little mini consoles are amazing. I love them. She loves them. We love them. They're fantastic. I think there's just something about playing it on a real, official product from Nintendo. You know, it's not... Okay, I've played on Raspberry Pis. You know, I've got emulators. I've got all this stuff. I've got all these games. I can, I've got them all at my fingertips. But there's something about playing with that console... That's an official hardware, an official product. You know what it is? It's about the input. It's about the controller. If you buy a Raspberry Pi or you get something else, it always comes with these cheap knockoff wannabe Super Nintendo controllers in their garbage. And I know what you're saying, but Jay, we don't even fucking use those, you dummy. We don't even use them, you dummy. Oh, fuck. What we do is we plug in our other nice controllers, our Xbox or PS4 or you know, our Logitech. We plug in a different type of input. We play with it, and I know, and I do that too, which is the way to do it. But there's something about playing the Super Nintendo games or the NES games or, or any of these on, on the hardware. It's super, super nice, and I love it. So we've been going back and having a really, really good time playing it. What have we been playing? We've been doing Kirby's Adventure. Let me talk about the games that we recently completed. This has happened in probably the last three weeks. We uh, first busted out the NES Classic, and we played through Kirby's Adventure Brilliant game, probably one of my personal favorites, uh, easily top 10 uh, on that system. Lots of fun. In fact, I have a top 10, uh, top 20 NES games video on YouTube if you really want to know my opinion on what I, what I like on that console. You can go ahead and check that video out. And you can go look at all of the fucktards that are on there talking about how my list sucks and their list is better and all this stuff. You know what? Do you want, you want people to attack you? Literally, do you want people to tell you how stupid and idiotic and dysfunctional you are? Make a video about your top whatever list, and people will absolutely degrade you so hard. I can't even, I, I just, I stopped reading them. It's just, there's thousands of comments. Anyway, but check that video out. I really liked that video. I was really proud of it. It's on YouTube. Hey, um, so Kirby's Adventure, we've been doing that. Tons and tons of fun. We then plugged in the Super Nintendo and been having a lot of fun in there. Playing Kirby Superstar, kind of having a Kirby kick. That game is a ton of fun. It has a bunch of mini games in it, and you you play the mini games, and then unlocks the next mini game. But the mini games are some of them are like just a mini game, and then you have almost like a Kirby's Adventure style. Uh, you work through stages and fight bosses, and you actually have like missions to do and, and, and levels to complete and bosses to fight. It's a ton of fun. What a great game. I think there's two, three, four, what is there, six or seven mini games or eight? I don't know. I have the cartridge. I should have brought that out to actually look. But it's a ton of fun. Love that one. If you have a Super Nintendo Classic, you should definitely load that game on there and play it. It's a ton of fun. Uh, another one that we went back to, and Stephanie had never completed this game, so we wanted to actually jump in and do it. Super Mario World. Can you believe it? One of the greatest all-time games. And I was so happy to sit down with her and go through that game. It was a lot of fun, and it really didn't take that long. I think I think we... Shit, I don't remember, four or five hours, something like that. Not that long. And even with her going back and trying to get as many um, secrets and things like that, you know, I kind of just casually played through it. But she's more of a completionist when it comes to that. She likes, she likes to find the secrets and find all the little hidden items and stuff like that. And that, that's all part of it. It's fun. It's, we're playing Donkey Kong Country right now, too. We just beat the first one. We're working on the second one. And, uh, my God, I may have some thoughts on DK. DKC2 after we're done with it, man. I, going back to it now, first of all, I just want you to know that Donkey Kong Country is one of my all-time favorite, if not my top game on that console. So, But me playing the second one, I, I may have some thoughts. I may have some thoughts. There's some fucking bullshit going on in there. There's some fucking troll levels, and there's some, there's some real, like... Um, there's some level gimmicks, man, like the wind and fucking taking squawks, going down in the beehives when there's bees everywhere. And all you're trying to do is kind of avoid the bees. Like, that's some bullshit, man. 
That's some bullshit. It kind of pisses me off, but we'll talk about that at a later date once we finish it. Um, another game I've been playing, a more modern game, came out a mo- actually a month ago tomorrow? A month ago tomorrow. Far Cry New Dawn. And uh, I was on Twitch. I was streaming it live for a little bit. So shout out to that. If you want to come on by, twitch.tv slash heinyhouse. Make sure to give me a follow and turn on those notifications so you know when I go live. But come on by, hang out. And I was playing that, man. I love the Far Cry games. I think I talked talked a little bit about it on stream. I, I, I played Far Cry from the very beginning. And uh, I loved it. I played it on PC first. In fact, Far Cry, the original Far Cry was released on Wii, if I remember. And... um Man, very ambitious to have and play. But I kind of got lost in the second one. Excuse me. I kind of got lost in the second one. I don't know if I needed my hand held a little more or what. Or maybe my 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 crazy brain wasn't prepared to, to understand that this is an open world sandbox. I mean, sure, I played Grand Theft Auto in the past. I've done all that shit. And I, I played Smuggler's Run. So I've, I've driven around. I've done this. But there was something about putting you in that world, a real feeling world, and kind of just letting you go and explore and figure stuff out. I don't know if I really understood it quite then. I kind of feel like I needed my hand held a bit more. It's probably why I fucking got lost in Skyrim. Couldn't figure out what the fuck to do. I'll tell you about the story in Skyrim, dude. I popped that game in. I fucking spawned in. Here I am. Fucking, I'm I'm ready to rock. I'm ready to do this shit. Bring on the fucking, uh, bring on the, the trolls and the fucking scrags or whatever they're called. Like, let's go. Let's go. So I fucking run up the hill. I, I'm out of the fucking village. I'm running up the hill. Do, 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 do. I run up in the mountains because it's snowing up there and I want to see this beautiful snow. I fucking go up there. What happens, dude? The fucking abominable snowman comes out. The fucking Wolverine, this frosty Wolverine dude comes out, just fucking slays me. Bam! Hits me. Instantly dead. Game over. I'm like, what in the fuck is this? For fuck's sake. I don't know what the hell was going on with that, and I died, and it, it's really frustrating. Those games, you have to grind, and you have to craft, and you have to build yourself up. And I think early on in my early gaming days, I didn't really understand that. So, uh, yeah. So I'm coming back to a lot of these games and this always been the running gag with me is like, Oh, uh, Jay, you're going to play Skyrim. You're going to go through that sometime. Yeah. When health freezes over, I think someone is going to have to help me. I'm going to have to have a whole team of people there helping me get through Skyrim. And I'm I'm kind of a minority when it comes to this. I know Skyrim, one of the greatest games of all time, but uh, I don't really like it that much because I fucking suck at it. I didn't really have any fun with it. But I love Dying Light, Dead Island, all these games that have kind of prepped me. They've kind of marinated me into now I'm ready. I think I'm ready to take take the bull by the horns, if you will. I think I'd understand it a little bit better. So maybe I'll run back into it. Wow, that was a fun rant. Far Cry New Dawn. I've <laughs> been playing that. Tons of fun. Love Far Cry. Love the series. Three is probably my favorite, followed by five. And then New Dawn is very, very good. Very brutal, very dark. Love the open exploration. And I've really only hit like, uh, I'm very, I've been playing maybe two hours, two and a half hours. I'm still very low level. So I'm excited to work my way up get some level uh, tier two and tier three weapons and really go in there. I need a silencer to fuck those people up in the compound. So, cause every time you shoot, they know where you are. And they're like, Oh, I like to play stealth. So tons of fun with that. Okay. Um, I've been, of course, I've been playing some Forza horizon horizon four. You know, I love that game. Love that game. I do feel, well, first of all, let me, let me preface this. Let me say Forza horizon four is, Probably one of the best arcade racing games I have played in easily the last 10 years. There really hasn't been a game that has captured the essence of driving, the thrill of driving, the fun of driving. The game is beautiful. It looks absolutely incredible. I don't care if you're playing it on Xbox One or PC. It looks beautiful. It looks better on PC, that's for sure. You've got the hardware for that. But the game runs so nice on both. It's cross-platform. You can play... Xbox can connect with PC people you can play, and I love it. There's so much, so much to do. In fact, there's so much to do. I haven't even completed it, any of it, any of, like, the extra missions and things like that. 
I've just kind of gone through the storyline and progressed. And I love collecting cars. You can have like 700 some odd cars in your stable. I don't know how many there are. Just like a thousand some odd cars you can get. What an amazing game. And what an achievement in the automotive um, arcade racing genre. It's so, so good. If you guys get a chance, play it. Pick it up. Go to a friend's house, whatever. Check it out. Try it. I guarantee you, you'll like it. If you're at all interested in arcade racers, th this is a must-have title. Um, it does have its flaws, and I will say the number one flaw for me is the online, the PvP. It's fucking broken, man. The load times. Every time I play, I'm like, this is fucking Load Simulator 2019. It's so annoying. Now, say what you want about crew. I don't really want to go down this tangent, this rant about crew. I'm not going to do that. And that's a really shame, by the way, because the crew is dead in the water. And I think they have a great game and a great game engine. They could have done something amazing with it, but they don't know what in the fuck they're doing. And the game is the game is dead in the water. Pun intended, because you can drive boats in that game. Which, it's amazing, by the way. The water in that game. Oh, my God. They need to make a water-based game. Fuck, they need to do like a uh, speedboat. They need to do like a another uh, Hydro Thunder or jet ski or do something. So good. But, you know, they I don't know how they, they got the load times to be so low in the crew, in the crew too, for that matter. It's amazing. But Forza, for fuck's sake, man. I raise for two minutes, but I load for like three or four. Like, this doesn't make any sense. It takes so long to load. I don't understand. I don't get it. Doesn't it doesn't matter. It's like the gameplay. It's not very very good when you got to sit there and load. You just get annoyed the whole time. But uh, yeah, I don't know, man. We've got this weird. We've got this weird thing going on. <sighs> do I even talk about this right now? Well, fuck it. Whatever. It's my show. I can I can break off and do what I want. Here's the thing. We have a problem with. Um. It's, it's, this is really common in racing games. I don't know why it's it's being common in these racing games you have oh man this is this is going to take longer than i hope all right you guys in are you guys in for this are you guys in for the long haul are you ready for this i've i've thought about this for many many years i'm going to try to sum it up in like five or ten minutes this is going to be tough here we go you have a game this game is online you have a pool of people that play it when you give people the choice when you give people the ability to play either this mode that mode or this mode or this mode four options what happens is majority of the people will migrate to the mode that is most fun or that they enjoy the most this is a preference what happens then once the game loses popularity once it goes down the, the chart or down in the sales chart and they're not buying it anymore and it's not very popular anymore your online community starts to dwindle that small group of diehard people a very small handful will still continue to play. They will also play the mode that they like the most, all right? When the developers give you that option. When the game first comes out, this is not a problem. We've got millions of people playing or hundreds of thousands of people playing and they're playing all the game modes. There's enough to go around. There's enough people for everything to work. When it starts to dwindle, when it starts to die off and people start playing other games or they patch it, they fuck it up or people are mad at it and things people start moving on, those other game modes, say we had four, now maybe only one or two are getting attention by real people playing online. What happens to the other two? Dead. Doesn't happen. No one's playing in there. So what happens to you if you log in and you say, I want to play one of these game modes that is now dead, by the way. You don't know that, but you're just, you want to play it, all right? So you jump in the lobby. You get in there and you wait. Tick, 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 tick. No one's playing. What happens? You can't match make. Tick, 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 tick. You're getting pissed. You're like, what the fuck? This game's dead in the water, right? That's what happens. This is real shit. This happens to me all the time. So what happens then? People start complaining. Well, who picks it up? News articles, online communities, forums. People start bitching. This fucking game is dead. Look, I can't even play it. You, if you're streaming online and you show that shit, that's bad press, baby. That's bad news bears. You get on YouTube, you're trying to play, you're trying to show it off, can't get in a lobby, can't match make, that's bad news bears. You got a problem. So the developers are like, oh, fuck, how are we going to fix this? This is how they fix it. I don't know why no one talks about this shit. No one talks about this. You know what? Most people who are like gamers are going there and playing, like, you got to invest time into this game to understand when this shit happens. You can see it. You can feel it. You're experiencing it. So what happens then? The developers say, okay, 
Um, we used to have 200,000 people playing it daily. Now we have 10,000. Okay, that's not enough people to go around all these game modes. So what we need to do now is instead of give them the option to pick, we must pigeonhole them. We must force them to play one game mode. And it has to be a roulette. It has to be a random thing. Because we have to, now we were allowing them to go into their own rooms, but now those rooms are empty and they're only playing one game mode. So now we need to put all the rooms into one room. Now it is one room. And when you go click online, you get thrown into a lobby with everyone else from all over the world. Don't even start talking to me about fucking ping and latency and bullshit. Server issues. Oh, man, I can have, I'll have your ass on that one, man. Don't get me fired up on that. So what happens is now we're all in the same room. Okay, are you guys following me? Are you, are you, are you there? But what happens? Uh, well, I wanted to play this game mode that I've always been able to play. Always been able to do it. Now I can't. I get in a lobby. Here is this person from the U.S., this person from China, this person from Africa, this person from Europe, this person's in wherever. They're all over the world in the same lobby. One lobby. Where the fuck is that server located? Because we've got 400 ping dude here. We've got 60 ping here dude here. We've got 120 ping dude here. They're fucking all over the place. Laggy bullshit. Matchmaking's fucked. Because... Their game is now dying. The community is dropping. They are forcing all of us now to play nice together. And it doesn't work. It doesn't work. I bought a game that I cannot go into and play online the way that I want. That's bullshit. That's bullshit. Right now, I can load up Battlefield 4. I can load up Battlefield Bad Company 2. Mind you, a game that's, we're celebrating almost 10 years, actually this year, 10 years old. I can right now go in, log on, which, God bless it, right? EA hasn't pulled the servers yet. Well, actually they have, but because it's all, it's community driven, it's community supported. I can go on in there and if I want to play Laguna, I can just go, boom, do it. I want to play uh, Team Deathmatch, I can find a server. I can, I can find what I want and I can play how I want. For the most part, on a game that's 10 years old. We're talking about games that are not even a year or two old. They're, they're doing this shit. So I try to get through that as quickly as possible. But do you guys follow me on this? This is the problem that we have with online gaming um, in communities where the game comes out, it's popular, but then when it drops off, when it dies, we can no longer really... like they. This has happened to me numerous times in games. And I can't right now go in and load a game and play how I want. Forza, and this is all this talk, all this this ranting about this, this is a serious deal, and I'm very passionate about it. I don't like it. I don't appreciate it, and I think it's bad for, for the customer. It's bad for the gamer, and it's bad It's bad press, man. It's, it's a bad look. The shit doesn't look good. I mean, in Forza, what the fuck is this team adventure? Sounds good on paper. You throw us in a fucking random lobby. Sure, it's like, it's a random choice. We can't even pick the, like, we can't pick the, the class, the type, the car, really. We can't even really pick that. It's like, well, we're going to do dirt in A class in winter. That's what we're going to pick for you. You just figure that out. No, 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 no. Fuck you. I want to pick street cars, fucking uh, S1 class in the summer. Like, that's what I want to do. I bought your game. Give me that option. It's there. What is this random bullshit? It's because if they give you too many options, you will. You will play what you want and not the others. And in a way, they don't want that because it dies off the rest. It doesn't make, I mean, it makes sense, but it doesn't make sense. And it's really frustrating. That's just happening. That's in Forza. That's in Crew. That's in lots of online racing uh, r racing games. You know, uh, there's a whole handful of them. Uh, Drive Club, um, PS4. I mean, Gran Turismo Sport. I, don't, I haven't played that one yet, but I assume it's probably kind of the same way. Maybe not. I don't know. But it's frustrating, and I hate. I do not want to see the future of this continue. It needs to stop. Holy shit! I'm sorry. I'm so sorry, guys. I love you, and uh, you know. 
I get fired up when I get pissed. As a gamer, I'm I'm standing up for us, the gamers, all right? A lot of people don't talk about this shit. They don't give a fuck. Well, I'm picky, and I give a fuck. I care about this stuff. I want to play a game how I want to play. Is that too hard? Is that too hard for me to just be like, I want to fucking drive this car in this way on this road. I bought your game. Let me. And it sounds stupid. I know. It kind of sounds petty, but no. Whew. I start playing this shit, and I'm just like, no, God, please, no, no, no. How about some more uh, uh, gaming news before we move on? Some FPS news. Some good stuff happening there. I was going to talk about one uh, uh, shooter that was coming out, and then I started to realize that there was actually maybe like three or four really cool shooters that are coming up. So I'm like, fuck it. Let's do a little FPS section. My two, my two loves, right? Racing and shooters. Is, it's a beautiful thing. So uh, FPS news. Some shooters that I'm looking forward to that are coming out uh, this year or, or are already out. Say that ten times fast. Game called Dusk. It's on Steam right now. I haven't played it yet. I've been looking at some... Oh, my God. Have I left the fucking beer up there the whole time? <laughs> oh, my God, you guys. I love you. you. I love you. I fucking left the beer picture up there Saturday morning the whole time. That's right. <laughs> Dude. Hey, uh, Smart Mouth Brewing, reach out to me, bro. Let's sponsor the episode. Come on. Oh, my God. That's hilarious. Hilarious. People in the audio farm are like, they didn't see it. I've had the picture of the beer up the whole time to my right. <laughs> I love this show. I love this show so much. Um, all right. Um, let's mute. Let's turn this shit off. Because uh, I have some FPS news that I was going <laughs> to talk about. Lots of great retro-inspired shooters that are um, coming out or are already out. Like I said, a game called Dusk. Um, I don't have a, do I? No, I don't. Let me just see. I'm going to pull up a little bit of my YouTube and I'll have uh, the picture of it. Oh, a picture of it playing in the background. Um, what I love is that we have a bunch of new games that are coming out and they're inspired by the retro games. I think that's fantastic. And when they're, when they do it right, here we go. Here's a little let's play. Let me just fire this back up. What, and this is so, so nice. Let's just skip forward a little bit for you guys to see. Um, ooh, this looks good. This looks good. Of course, this guy looks like he is fucking speedrunning the shit out of this game right now. But uh, look at this. It's very nice. It's, uh, wow. Yeah, he just completed it in like three seconds. But it's, it's uh, uh, you know, a more darker game. And it almost looks kind of like Quake in a way, doesn't it? Kind of has Quake vibes, and also has a little bit of a Soldier of Fortune vibes with like the gib, the gibbiness of it, of like limbs flying everywhere. Very uh, kind of low res. Um, you know, the guns are look like they're just kind of textures. Wow, this guy's speed running like crazy. Good stuff. So that's what I'm looking forward to. Dusk. Um, I heard about it recently, and uh, seems to be something that I would be into. So maybe I will look into getting that. I don't own that one yet. Uh, it's on Steam, evidently. Um, this is big news. And shout out, here we go, Duke Nukem behind me here. But shout out to 3D Realms. They announced Wrath Aeon of Ruin is the game coming out. And I think I have a clip of it here. I tried to pull up and be prepared for y'all. And you can see here that this is very much in the vein of 90 shooters. Uh, again, kind of a, a nice darker game here. It looks like we have maybe some puzzles going on, breaking through doors and these like monsters come out. And this guy's got this big ass dagger. Pretty fantastic, this game looks amazing. And anything from 3D Realms, I mean, come on, we, we support 3D Realms, they do amazing work. I've been with them since the beginning of time. But what a nice, what a nice change to have something that's, you know, these games are a little bit, they're low, they're kind of low res, they're um, a throwback, they're uh, banking in on your nostalgic uh, past with these games, and I'm all for it, absolutely all for it. Sometimes you just kind of want to get in a game, you know, play around, have fun with it, not have too much pressure of, 
you know, this huge graphic intense, uh, can I run it type shit. You just want to jump in and have fun and slay zombies or monsters or what have you. So, uh, but that's a new one from 3D Realms. Wanted to mention that. Come on, folks, they're back on the map. Let's uh, let's show some love, sh show some support for them, which is really nice. And um, another one uh, that I want to talk about is uh, from Void Interactive. Now, I've been following this game for about a year, and they just recently posted a gameplay video, some gameplay footage, which is kind of gameplay, but it's sort of trailer-ish still. So I, I think it's it doesn't say that it's in the game engine per se, but um, this gives you kind of a nice idea of what this game's about. I'm going to go ahead and hit play, let it go. You guys know, as I'm showing here, a box of SWAT 4. This is one of my all-time favorite tactical shooters. This is the game that defined tactical shooters and so, so long ago. And uh, I have I have this, I even have the uh, expansion right here. Got them both in box. Very nice. That's not hard to show those. I'll put those aside. But uh, I love tactical shooters. I love having something where you plan out your attack. You, you look at the blueprints or the floor plan, and you try to figure out the best point of entry, um, your loadout. Your gear list, what you're going to have, uh, light or heavy armor, the type of weapons, what sidearms. Are you taking bangers in there? Are you taking breaching charges? Are you going in guns blazing? Are you going in very tactical and methodical and slow? I love that. Some people don't like that, and I get that. And there's hundreds of games out there for you that can scratch that itch. But when it comes to slow, tactical, and methodical games like this, it's very slim pickings. Now, mad love to 505 Studios a long time ago. Um, I even forget the name of it, man. I remember I saw them in PAX, at PAX 2012. And I sat down with them, and we, we were playing some of their games, and they had a new one coming out. Fuck, I don't remember the name of it. I feel so bad. Um, but it was supposed to be like this, and, and unfortunately, it fell very, very short. It was very buggy, uh, had a lot of issues, a lot of just a lot of really bad problems for it. So it fell flat and then the game died quickly. So we have been waiting. We've been waiting for a real tactical shooter and no rainbow six siege is not a tactical shooter. And I'm sorry. I mean, I may, I may, uh, may upset the cow when I tip it over here, but the early Rainbow Six games, Raven Shield, Athena Sword, yes, those are all very tactical. Even the Vegas, Rainbow Six Vegas 1 and 2, even those are very tactical and fun to play. Love those. But the new one, unfortunately, is not. It's kind of a mix of, of not that, more like Call of Duty. And, um, you know, it's a little, it's much faster, in fact. I want something slow. I want to wait at a door for a minute or two while I'm waiting for somebody to walk out of sight to where I then can go in and you know, engage that target or, you know, try to arrest that target, try to be non-lethal, less lethal. It's a lot of fun. So that's something that I'm very, very excited for. As you can see in this shot right here, see, he's, he's, he's telling the person, he's commanding him to drop the weapon and surrender. He did. He then zip tied his arms and arrested him. That's very, 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 very cool. And a lot of fun to do. If you can be less lethal, it's a lot of fun. I'm talking a lot about this because I'm really excited for it. I think this is so, so awesome. Very, very much excited for the uh, the release of this. And um, I don't think there's a release date, is there? Uh, it's got, it has got says pre-order. Actually doesn't say, but uh, GameSpot Trailers just posted this. So go go online and check it out and take a look at it. Oh, here's, here's a cool little clip here. It throws a banger in. Boom. You know, putting some claymores down. Checking the door. Pick, lock, you know, picking the lock on the door. Super cool. A lot of fun stuff. So looking forward to that. If you guys are into that type of game, hit me up, let me know, and uh, we can squat up and uh, try to make some tactical fun stuff there. Last bit on the gaming news here, and this I just recently heard, was that uh, we have a, uh, I mean, hell has frozen over, folks. Hell has frozen over, and it is official, but Microsoft have announced they are releasing a Master Chief Collection coming to PC. Nice. Perfect. Very nice indeed. I cannot wait. In fact, I was blown away back in the early 2000s when we started to get other 
uh, Halo games, and they weren't on PC. I thought, what the fuck? Are you for real, Microsoft? Hello, Microsoft, the inventors of Windows. Why do we not have Halo? And it's very simple. They were trying to push their consoles, trying to push their consoles in sales. Makes sense. They've got a huge franchise. Amazing stuff. And at the time, sure, PC gaming was big, and there was a big market. In fact, I think there's more of a market back then than there was maybe in like five or 10 years. See, we had this kind of lull in PC gaming as well. I want to call it the late 2000s, Windows, uh, what, Windows uh, Vista and Windows 8 days. We kind of had a, a weird cycle where it's it's up and down, it's up and down. You know, when Microsoft fucks up Windows, the whole gaming world gets fucked up with it. So we have this weird kind of uh, lull here and there. But during those times, we were kind of low with it. And uh, it made sense for them to push it for the consoles because they want to sell Xboxes. I get it. <clears throat> but so what we have now, though, is that a Master Chief Collection, get this, folks, Master Chief Collection coming to Steam. What? What? I don't know what the fuck I'm reading. Get wrecked, mate. On Steam? Microsoft? Wow, this is big news. Okay, here are the games. Here's the game list. You ready? Halo Reach Around. Or, oh, sorry, I must have been a typo. Halo Reach. <clears throat> Halo 1. It's called Halo Combat Evolved. Uh, it's the Anniversary Edition. Halo 2 Anniversary Edition. Halo 3. Halo 3 ODST campaign, and Halo 4. According to Microsoft themselves, they said that these games will be released in stages and can be bought individually. There's no release date yet. So we have this amazing news of Halo Master Chief Collection, right? Master Beef is coming to town. But we don't have a release date, and we don't even know if we can actually buy them all together. It looks like it's going to be a fucking piecemeal thing here. Uh, Doesn't really make a lot of sense now, does it? Wouldn't it be nice to just down buy them all and have them all at once? Yeah, they got to stagger that shit out. They're going to be milking this like a cow on fucking Barnyards Anonymous. This is going to be a, uh, a long time uh, in the making here, I think. So, hey... I'm not complaining. I'm just happy because we have some Halo games coming to PC. It did say in the article, I did read, I did make a note just to, to let my diehard PC people know that they are uh, having proper mouse and keyboard support, right? So they are they are redoing the uh, input algorithms and uh, processes to make sure that mouse works properly and also having proper field of view sliders. Bravo. Fucking bravo. Fucking bravo, man. All right. Now we're talking. Now we're cooking with grease. Should be good stuff. So I'm looking forward to that. So thank you, Microsoft, for bringing that to life. We're excited for it, and uh, we'll be purchasing it. We'll be supporting you. Thank you. <clears throat> Folks. I have so much to talk about on tech news here. There's a lot of great stuff. And I also have a lot of great big box stuff to talk about here. So we, again, this is just a jam-packed episode. And I'm really, really excited for all this stuff. I'm thinking that this is more or less like the cloud. I'm calling it the cloud stream gaming wars. This shit is in full effect, folks. This Now, cloud streaming, cloud gaming, rather, you know about cloud saving, um, but... Cloud gaming has it's been around for a while. In fact, now one of the first kind of commercial, I don't think it was the first, but one of the first commercialized mass-produced console and cloud gaming services to hit the market and fail miserably, unfortunately, is something called OnLive. In fact, you know what? Fuck this. I'm, I got my thing here. Let me just pull it up real quick. You guys remember OnLive? It was a service that you could... And actually, it was free to go on and spectate and watch people. 
you could play games. And I'm I'm typing in my name here because I have I have a video. Oh god, it even says the emulator review. Holy shit. Eight years ago, let me pull this up. If you go on to YouTube and you type in on live Jason Heine or Heine House, you'll pull up my video here of on live. And this is this is my day one. It released in the morning. I woke up, I rolled out of bed, and I got on my computer, and I just started, I hit record, and I wanted to show this. In fact, my voice was still all like, I was still waking up. I, I hadn't had my coffee yet. But this is a video, and I'm, I'm showing the on live service. And it was a, a great, great service, and what a great concept and idea, something that is now happening today, almost uh, eight years later. And I feel bad because on live, I don't think the internet kind of infrastructure, I don't think people were groomed for this type of service yet. And I just think it was way ahead of its time. And it just did not get the support it needed, either from developers, uh, publishers. So it, it, and unfortunately, it died pretty quick. But it worked on Mac and PC. Uh, and I think it even had, actually, it, it did have a little console uh, with a controller. In fact, I still have mine. I still have mine in box. I don't even think it's open. I never opened it. It's probably worth nothing, but I still think it's so cool to have. And you here it is right here. You can see you can basically, it looks like tiles, and you can pick profile, my games, coming soon, arena, last played, my friends list, very clean, very easy. And it shows what you're seeing there are games playing on these tiles. Those are real games playing right now. At the time, you can click on one, and it would just pop you into spectate it. You could watch somebody else, wherever in the world, playing this game. You had a friends roster, friends list, you had messaging, messaging service. It was dope. It was totally dope. So, unfortunately, it didn't get the support it needed, and it died. It died very quick, and that's what's really sad. So, here, so there's the video. Go check it out. It's on YouTube. You see it here. Here's the name of it. On live gaming service. F first look, navigation demo, the emulator review with Jason Heine. Fucking shit, man. Rest in peace, EMU review. There's a little shout out. All my old school heads know about that. So, but what's happening now is our internet infrastructure is now good. It's now there. I think a lot of a lot of uh, places have uh, fiber optic internet. You have gigablast internet. Uh, you have just the internet is blazing fast. It's it's really now being more and more groomed and tuned to do something like this. Why do you think Netflix is so popular? I mean, Netflix used to be on DVDs, if you remember. You would you would check out a movie and it would mail you like next day and mail you a DVD of that and you would watch it and you return that shit. Same thing kind of like with Redbox. You go to Redbox, which is still around. You can go around, get a DVD or a movie. And a lot of, a lot of um, Redboxes have uh, games that you can get as well. So you go check out a game, play the game, rent it, whatever, and then you go and return it at this red box at the most shadiest fucking ghetto Circle K that you can find. You're going to be fending for your fucking life at these places, but I'm here to return the notebook, motherfucker. I'm just trying to return it. Please don't take my notebook. I'm just trying to return the notebook. Please. Go inside, get a slushy, you're all right. Google wants to introduce cloud gaming. Folks, it's happening. If anyone's going to do it, it's going to be fucking Google. It's called Project Stream. And they created a controller, or at least what people are speculating to be a controller. Oh, no, that's beer. I know I got it up here somewhere. There it is. There is the projected... I'm not sure if that's a leaked photo or what. Um... Who reported this? Games Radar reported this. It's a picture of a controller. It looks very uh, Google-like, very colorful. It looks like a typical controller. You got a D-pad on the left, two analog sticks. They look a little small to me. Bottom of the controller in the middle, you got a microphone button. You got a big G button in the middle, probably your, your Google button. You got a home button on the top left, little uh, extras or options button on the right. Four face buttons. Looks like a couple of triggers up top. Looks like non-analog. Fuck off with the non-analog, people. God, stop that. Give us analog on the triggers, for fuck's sake. For fuck's sake. Um, but that looks interesting. What they want to do, folks, is they want to create uh, cloud gaming, and they want it to run in the Chrome browser. 
very interesting and very ambitious. You know, Chrome, Chrome used to be a very small and lightweight uh, internet browser when it first came out. And I think a lot of people switched from, <clears throat> they switched from, well, fuck, if you're still using Internet Explorer, you better just, again, you better just wipe your computer clean, reformat it, uninstall Windows, put a fresh install on Windows in there, and go donate your computer to Goodwill. There's no reason for you to be using the Internet Explorer. But a lot of us jump ship from even um, Firefox back in the day uh, for Chrome. I know I use Chrome, and uh, I like it, but it's starting to get heavy. Like after going to the buffet for a while, you got yourself a little heavy in the trousers. Got yourself a little, little bit of heaviness. Starting to be a little bit bigger, a little bit bloated. So you got to watch that. So I can't even imagine if we're going to introduce cloud gaming on Chrome. We're going to be basically running like a fucking a browser that's going to take like 50 to 60% of your processing power. This shit is going to be intense. I'd be very interested to know benchmarks on that. But that's what they want. That's their uh, their their plan. In fact, uh, GDC starts next week. This was the day ago they posted this. But I think it's uh, the 18th through the 21st. Uh, GDC starts, that's in California, I believe, or maybe that's Las Vegas. No, that's CES, that's in Las Vegas. Anyway, they're going to be mentioning uh, this. So this is going to be very interesting. So here's the timeline, folks. Just listen to this. this. A lot of news happened. Here's the timeline. This got brought up, like, last week. People are, like, freaking out, right? The Internet's, the internet's ablaze. They're like, holy shit, Google's going to bring cloud gaming. It's predicted to be announced next week at the Game Developers Conference, GDC. Then, follow me, then a wild Microsoft appears on March 13th. I even put the dates here because I was following this shit. March 13th, just a few days ago, three days ago as of recording this right now, Microsoft comes up and says, hey, uh, guess what, guys? <clears throat> hi, hi, yeah, this is Microsoft. Uh, uh, we just uh, updated our, the latest version of uh, an app called the Wireless Display app. Uh, yeah, it's been out there for a little while, but uh, we just updated it. And, and now we are going to let you uh, allow you to stream PC titles, uh, you know, games that you play on Windows, um, you know, on Steam. You know, you play it on Steam. We're going to let you put those uh, on your uh, Xbox console. We're going to let you stream that from PC to Xbox One. What? What? This app also, I put on here, also offers Xbox controller support, so you will be able to play that game on said console with familiar controls on Xbox One. I'm all for it. I think this is fantastic. Hey, big big ups to uh, to Microsoft for introducing this app. Now, of course, in the app store, all the reviews are completely fucking terrible. That may be a whole side tangent, but they're working the bugs out, all right? They're working the bugs out. It's newly launched. Everyone's talking about it. Everyone's been reporting it. It's pretty fantastic. Let me just go and take this off because I might forget the picture there, which is pretty fantastic. Uh, I like it. I like where we're going with that. Then, here's the timeline. Follow me, folks. Then, a wild steam approaches... Like the next day, pretty much. And they says, uh, hi, I'm Gabe. Uh Gabe Newell here. Uh uh can't seem to get Half Life 3 done, but um uh if you bought one of those uh Steam links uh that you that you had on our store or that we had but you bought on our store, uh you can now use that. Uh, oh, wait, no, that's different. No, I want to tell you that we discontinued the Steam link. Yeah, that's what it was. They discontinued the Steam link, by the way. It allowed you to play through uh, through Big Picture on Steam. It allowed you to play your game to the Steam link, which then projected onto a TV through HDMI. They discontinued the Steam link. It's not for sale anymore. Sorry, back to my uh, Gabe impression. Uh, yeah, what we, what we wanted to tell you was... Um, I should listen to Gabe and make sure I'm close. I don't think I'm close, but oh well. You guys get the picture. Um, we're going to introduce a Steam Link Anywhere 
It's what we call it, Steam Link Anywhere. It allows you to stream Steam games from your computer uh, to anywhere uh, in the world uh, through the app, through an app that we made. Wait, what? This shit is dope. Let me break it down real quick for you. You download on your Android device, which Apple, for some reason, is still blocking it for whatever reason, because Apple's ridiculous and they want to just keep everything under their own roof. Probably there. I bet you Apple's coming out with a cloud gaming service, too. Don't be fucking surprised if this gets announced sometime this year. Mark my words. And I hope we all come back to episode three and just be like, holy shit, Jay, you fucking called it. I bet you Apple's working on something. That's why they're blocking this. But you, on your Android phone, you can download an app. It's a Steam, uh, Steam uh, Link Anywhere app, I believe it's called. Steam Anywhere? Fuck, I don't have the actual name. We downloaded it on Steph's phone and we tried it. It's amazing. So what you can do is you can download the app on your phone, turn your computer on, launch Steam on your computer, all right? Launch the app on your phone. It then says, oh, I see uh, you're on the same network, and I see your computer. I see a uh, Heine House computer. Should I sync to that? Yeah, please. Boom. Sync. Gives a code. Put the code in the PC to authenticate it. Then they're connected. They're authenticated. And boom. It pulls up everything on my desktop. The whole thing. Not just the game. Not just the game cap. No. Everything. Everything. If I'm on there watching Buttfuck Sluts Go Nuts 9, boom. It will show up on the phone. It's amazing. So you can pretty much play... Anything and everything. And stream it to a device. Now, what's cool about this is that it has controls that you can customize on your phone. It pulls up a virtual D-pad, joystick. It pulls up a virtual mouse pad. You can sit there and, like, with your finger move. And it moves on. I'm sitting here on my computer. Steph's in the bedroom. We're testing this out the other night. She can control my game. She's playing my game. It's intended for somebody who wants to launch it there and play it on their phone somewhere else. The shit is amazing. So we have, here we go, folks. Cloud gaming, the shit is happening. Now, people at OnLive are sitting there just probably just like this. Two fucking birds straight up in the air. Like, you know what? We did this almost 10 years ago. And you know what? The world wasn't ready. The internet wasn't ready. And I have to agree with you guys. Mad respect to OnLive for trying to come out first and do this. I really felt like they had a hit on their hands. I really felt like they had something special, something big. And they, they just, they couldn't break in. They couldn't break in. People didn't accept it. They weren't ready yet. I think people are ready now. And if this doesn't, you know, tell you from the announcements from Google, Microsoft, and Valve, folks, this shit is all going cloud and it's all going subscription based. We got to watch this shit. The cloud gaming wars. What do you think about cloud gaming? Are you into it? Are you all about it? Send me an audio question. Why don't you tell me what you think? Record yourself. Send it over. HeineHouseLive at gmail.com or hit me up on Discord. You can send it on to me in the private message over there as well. All the info is at HeineHouse.com if you really need to join the Discord. That's where you do it. I'd love to hear. I'd love to hear what you think. I like it, but again, I'm kind of torn because you never get the highest quality, right? You're streaming it. It comes down to your infrastructure. It comes down to your internet. It comes down to hardware. And software, not being buggy and fucked up. Um, last little bit of gaming, uh, no, last little bit of tech news. I guess Motorola is announcing possibly a Razer V4. Possibly? Maybe? I, uh, it was a leaked photo. And Steph was yelling at me the other day because she was like, holy shit, look. And I saw this. Let me see if I can. Let me see if I can pull up the photo for anyone who's watching on the, uh, the live feed. This is not a great picture, but this is all I got. Oh, it's a YouTube video. Okay, cool. So evidently, and we talked about folding phones last episode, and here we are, a Motorola V4. It's called. Now remember, remember that a lot of these phones are now being foldable. You can do this. The technology is there. So evidently what's happening is we have, oh, there's a guy's getting a shout out there on my channel right there. Why well, I'm using this video, so it's only right. It says it's coming February 2019. Well, that shit has already passed. That's an old photo. But the idea is that the phone is a flip phone, but it has a, um, 
screen the entire side of basically the inside of the phone and you'll be able to flip it and open up and then just basically a big massive screen for your phone very fascinating i don't know i really don't know if it's you know true or not there's kind of a weird shot of the the back side of it looks like it has a screen at the bottom as well open up yeah it's very fascinating i don't know if this is real or not but anyway there's some leaked photos obviously that's an old article but to give you an idea i think motorola is working on something in there that could be really really fascinating it's like two screens that fold and become one very interesting um sounds really crazy uh last bit here ps4 is now you can stream that here we go again with the streaming i should have put this earlier ps4 you can now stream that to ios People have been talking about that. There's a way to do that now. I don't really have any context for that. I just recently heard about that. And also, this is a rumor. I, I didn't even spend any time looking into this, so you guys let me know if this is true or not. I'm not trying to... I'm really not trying to create any rumors or anything. It's just shit that I hear on the line. And you know, the internet's full of shit anyway. But um, I guess Xbox games... You guys may have heard this. Xbox games are coming to the Switch? Like what, a DLC or what? You can stream it or or what? Because the Switch is not that big of a powerhouse, right? Like on the hardware side of things. I don't know about that. Very fascinating. Give me some context on that. I didn't look it up. I just wanted to mention it. Have you guys heard that? Let me know what you got. All right, folks, the time has come. The time has come. Yes, it is time. It's the 30th anniversary of the World Wide Web it is an amazing time for the internet, and I'm so thankful for the internet. I, I, I owe the internet everything. I mean, if it wasn't for me going into America Online, into those shady chat rooms, typing in ASL, and finding those, those creeps, those creepazoids that were wanting to trade pick for pick, it was my very first time seeing real porno was in the America Online community chat rooms. And I I love you so much, and I want to thank you so much for that. And I think I'm going to start this, this whole segment talking about the internet by starting how we would start the internet. It's hard to imagine... But before we did anything online, we would have to hear the sound. But it wasn't just hearing a sound. It was us dialing into another universe. It was us dialing into and connecting to something that we have never connected to before. It wasn't just doing something. It was an experience. It was something that was so revolutionary, it was hard to explain to people what we were really doing. How can I take my computer that in the past has only been able to, I could type words in and hit a button and print it from this other device over here, a printer. And it would take like 10 minutes to do this. Now I'm using it to connect to something through a phone line and I'm going into another world. Well, that world was called the World Wide Web. And it was created 30 years ago this year. Tim Brenners-Lee created the internet in 1989. I'm pulling this info from a website, legend, uh, let's see, facts, factslegend.com. So you can go into research and look at all this cool stuff too. I have a bunch of fun facts for the internet that I want to talk about. And then I'm going to showcase some of my amazing and fun big box games. It'll be a treat for anyone uh, watching on the live video feed on YouTube. I will talk a little bit about the games, and so you can hear about it in audio form. But please, if you want to see the games in big box form, check out this feed on YouTube. 30th anniversary. My God, I cannot believe it was 30 years ago. We got into the Internet. I remember my household had the Internet at a very early stage of it. We were early adopters. And I feel very fortunate to be an early adopter. I know a lot of people who got into the Internet in... Um, I mean, really, either early 2000s or late 90s. It wasn't very accessible in the early 90s. And even in the mid-90s, it wasn't, it wasn't that accessible. It was very expensive, too, mind you, because you had to have the computer. You had to have the hardware. 
And not everyone did. And no disrespect, man. This shit was expensive. It was tough. So I feel very fortunate. I'm very, I'm very thankful that I was able to be there to have these memories and to share and to talk about this history. When we got the internet, it was a... Uh, and I, I really wanted to have the computer out here. I really want to do it. Maybe another time we'll do this. It's in the garage. I have my Macintosh Performa 450 that my, my parents bought back in like 1991, 92. It was a very, it was, it was our real first computer in the house. Um, that computer did not really go online. Uh, it was able to, but we didn't use it for internet. It wasn't until like 1993 1994, I think at the, no, it had to have been 93, because I remember 94. Had to have been 93, or late, late 92, we went and we bought a Packard Bell um, desktop. And I have that tower in the garage as well. I really wanted to bring it out to show everyone. But you would have a modem, and that connected to that computer. And then the modem, you would plug a phone line from the modem into the wall, and it would connect to the phone jack. The computer then, by using various software tools, most notably in the early days, you may have heard of CompuServe or Netscape or ours. The one we used was America Online. You would then click America Online. It would start and it would go through what you just heard here. It would actually, the modem would dial out to this number. It would then connect and you would hear all this gibberish bullshit. Didn't know what that was at the time. Thought it was just some weird shit happening. It was, in fact, the computer, the modem, communicating. That's data communicating in an audio form. I think it's so fascinating now, in hindsight, communicating and connecting you to their network. Which I think uh, when America Online first came out, um, it was either when it first came out or when they started to hit their really aggressive marketing campaign when they would blanket people with the uh, CDs of the software. I think it crashed. I don't think America Online was able to keep up with all the traffic that they had. It was very, very interesting times. So I feel very fortunate to have been able to be there from the very beginning. We had one phone line in our house, and our computer then would dial out, and we would get on America Online. It was very slow. We first started with a 14.4 uh, a uh, modem. And then we upgraded to a 28.8 a modem. This is the data transfer speed. And I thought, holy shit, it can't get any faster than this. 28.8, man, we are, we are fucking rocking. And then we upgraded. Our final upgrade before DSL came in was uh, 56K. Think about that. We started on 14 download. That's very, very slow. And then we went to 56. It's like four or five times. It's crazy. So we were, we, were, we were eating high on the hog. Felt pretty good about that. Well, what I love to do most is I played this game right here. I played Duke Nukem 3D, this one right here, with my friend John. Shout out to John. He doesn't, uh, I know a lot of Johns. <laughs> um, he doesn't listen to the show. I'm sure of it. I haven't talked to him in, in quite some time, but... Um, I would play this game with him to the wee hours of morning. In fact, until about like one or two in the morning, which was really late as a kid. And my mom would come downstairs. I'd hear her fucking boom, 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 come downstairs. And I'm like, oh, fuck. I know I'm screwed. I know I'm screwed. She'd open the door, Chase, get to bed. I'm like, okay, 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 okay. And I would uh, tell John, I would type. You could only type like this much. Like, hey, gotta go to bed. Like, okay, bye. The computers would dial. We would dial. And we do this at night because when you were using the computer for the internet, when you dialed it, dialed into it and, and connected, if anyone else in the house picked up a phone, they would just hear static. Just be like, right? That would then drop your connection because there was a break in the connection. And what's funny about that is I, whenever like somebody would pick up the phone, <laughs> I remember so this happened hundreds of times, hundreds of times. We pick up the phone. I'd be on the internet. I'd be I'd be playing gaming or whatever. We'd be doing something on, online, and the modem. It was a separate modem, right? It was a separate unit that sat next to your computer. Um, 
It later became internal and built in, but in the early days, it was an actual separate piece of hardware that you had to buy. And it had the speaker on it, obviously, so that we can hear all this bullshit going on. Well, when you pick up the phone, you hear the static, and you can talk into the phone, and whatever you say into the phone will come out of the speaker on the modem. So this was so fucking funny because so many times I would be on, I would be playing and all of a sudden I would just hear, I would hear someone, uh, someone pick up the phone and I would hear my speaker turn on and I would hear, oh shit, sorry. And I hear like my mom or my brother or someone like my dad would be like, hello, hello, hello. And I'd be like, hang up the phone. And so I'd be like, oh fuck it. It's too late. It's already disconnected. And I've tried to get on there and type to John real quick. Someone picked up the phone. I'm going to DC. I'm going to disconnect. And it's too late. We're already like, he's running in place. And Duke, he's just like, and I'm like, oh, shit. Disconnected. You know what's fucked up? When we used to play 1v1 on Duke, computer connected directly to computer. It was really like kind of like a LAN, if you think about it. Even though we weren't on the same network. We were dialing through phone numbers. God damn, that tripping me out. It almost wasn't LAN. We had no latency issues, no lag. No disconnections unless someone picked up the phone. Dude, it was flawless. Flawless. It's crazy, the early stages of this. I wanted to tell some of the story because it is very fascinating and a very... This is the primitive days. This is the really the pre... I want to say pre-internet, but this is the pre-mass internet days when it was very, very basic. Very much um, you dial in, you get connected. The pages on America Online or wherever you were browsing, they took forever to load. It was very slow. You would click a page and literally wait for like two minutes for this page to be like, burm, burm, burm. let me tell you, man, I traded so many picks, pick for pick on that shit, man. I, was, I had so many booby pictures on floppy disks. That's right. I said boobies and floppy in the same sentence. I had a lot of pictures. In fact, my friends would come over. I've told this, I've told this on All Gen Gamers so many times. My friends would come over to my house because I had a fucking shoebox full of different colored floppy disks. And depending on which color it was, it was different themes for things. And so people would come over and be like, yo, Jay, where's that box at? Yo, where's that shoebox at, homie? I'd be like, oh, it's over, it's over here. We pulled the shoebox. I'm like, what are you looking for? You know, I felt like a fucking drug dealer, to be honest. It's like, yo, man, what the fuck you need, homie? What do you need? What you need? We pull out a floppy disk. We put that in and be like, oh, okay. All right. All right. You looking for uh, uh, boobies, uh, brunette boobs? Okay. 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 I got you. You know, pop that in. But the photo would be like, burp, burp, burp. it would take forever to load, man. I couldn't tell you, man. It was a celebration when it went past your chest. You know, you could see the boobs finally. It was like amazing, amazing stuff. This is the early, you know what? People don't want to talk about this shit. Fuck it. You know what? This is the early stages of the internet. And you know what? Hey, it went somewhere. Hey, the porn industry, fucking huge. All right? So put that all to rest, dude. It actually went somewhere. Holy shit. I love the internet. I love those early days, man. It was so, There was something about it. It was so, something about it that was so... The unknown, it was so almost scary in a way. We just didn't know. Like, we knew what we were doing, but we didn't know what we were doing. We were connecting to this. I don't know what we were connecting to. What the fuck? Why do I, I get websites? There's, there's real people in here talking. To talk to a real person and see them type and hit enter, like that it's a real person, tripped me out. I know it sounds crazy. I know it sounds crazy, but it tripped me out. It was nuts. So cool. Early days. 30 years ago, mad respect. Tim, thank you for creating the internet. It was an amazing thing. I'm going to talk about a few fun facts before I show the games and before we wrap up the show. It was invented in 1989. Today, currently, 1.6 billion websites are online right now. And on this website, factslegend.com, I went and looked. They have a, a link to a live feed of how many websites are actually online right now. And it, it's constantly going up at a very fast pace, like tick, 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 tick. So it's a constant, constant growth of online websites. 1.6 billion right now. You know, what's interesting. We talk about Google and Google. I call it Google. Google didn't really uh, come up with Gmail, if you can believe it. This is fascinating. This is something I did not know. I find this really cool. Gmail.com was a free email service, and it stood 
for Garfield mail. You remember Garfield, the cartoon character? Yes, the cartoon character. What? I had no idea. So it was Gmail, Garfield mail. And then Google recently, or I say recently, then Google acquired that or purchased that from them and used it. I guess they really wanted G. They really wanted that letter. They, they just knew it. They saw like what was going to happen in the future. Like, we're going to fucking take over the world and we need Gmail. Give it to us now, you dirty bitch. Well, I got it. I've heard a few different stories of this. Um, I'm going to say the story that's on this website because I can actually like give credit to this. But the first webcam, according to factslegend.com, Oh, I'm sorry. It's factslegend.org. Have I been saying .com? It's .org. I'm sorry. If anyone's at factslegend.org or like, who the fuck is this guy? He's screwing up our website. Sorry, homie. The first webcam, according to them, was created to watch a coffee maker at Cambridge University. Article says that it would watch people go to the coffee machine to get coffee only to find out it was empty. Stop! 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 <laughs> so what you're telling me... <laughs> what you're telling me is that the first webcam was used to troll people. You've got mail. You, 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 you've got mail. I fucking love it. That's amazing. I love it. How do you pronounce it? GIF or JIF? I think the creator has gone on record to say it is pronounced GIF. But I've been calling it GIF for 30 fucking years. It's like when Nintendo said that it's actually pronounced SNES. Sorry, bro. I'm calling it SNES. That's just where I come from. So the GIF also was created in 1987 by a gentleman named Steve Wilkie. Thanks, Steve. Appreciate that. The first YouTube video ever to be posted in 2006, right? It is 2006, yeah. Was a video called Me at the Zoo. All right, you can look this up. It's still online. It's got a fucking trillion ass views or something. It is like 30 seconds long, and it is from... Uh, a founder of the San Diego Zoo. Jawid Karim. Sorry, hopefully I didn't butcher your name. It's of him at the San Diego Zoo. Standing there saying, hey, we're at the zoo. Check it out. It's pretty cool. Pretty fascinating. One of the, the first video on YouTube. And now look at it. ha 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 ha. The first ever message that was transmitted using the internet, get this, was log, L-O-G. Um, it was supposed to be login. They were trying to type login, but the enormous data load of the letter G crashed the entire network. Damn. It's brutal. They couldn't get their Gmail going. Um, that's very fascinating. I already talked a little bit about my gaming <clears throat> or my internet memories a little bit. Our first computer, Apple Performa 450. I talked about that. I still have it. I'll bring it out sometime. If you guys really want to see it, let me know. Um. We bought that at Incredible Universe. Shout out to Incredible Universe. It has now become Fry's Electronics, but it is a, a far cry from what the company used to be. Technology has changed. Market has changed. The internet, in fact, you know what's really sad when you think about it? Maybe I'll have a retrospective on companies that have gone under due to what they're selling. Ooh, that sounds like a great idea because um, technology has really buried a lot of companies. But these companies help create that technology. <gasps> They help sell it. They help bring it to market. That's fucked. That's getting fucked, man. That's a dirty, dirty deal. That's bad news, bears. 
We bought uh, our first computer there. Bought our second computer there, actually. We were on the Performa 450 on Mac. It would really use something called Clarice Works. It was a word processor. Anyone remember Clarice Works? Anyone use that? Or we were the only sorry sacks of shit in Oregon that used it. I would love to know. Printing was a pain in the ass. We would connect it with this big ass port. It was like this, it was like a serial port. This is before this is before USB, folks. This is pre-USB. It was freaking terrible. It would take forever. It would always jam. We'd always be able to print like 10 pages, then it would run out of ink. And the ink was like 50 bucks. It was crazy, man. Crazy. In fact, when I was in junior high, we would get extra credit on our reports, on our finals, if we were to print them. We would not get docked if we didn't. All right, The teachers were like, your handwriting is terrible, Jason. It is so fucking shitty. I can't understand or read. It's non-legible. I can't read it. So, for all the other kids who have terrible handwriting, if you can please, for the love of God, print your report and submit it, I will give you 10 points extra credit. 10 points extra credit. Holy shit. You know what little Jason thought? That's a whole fucking letter grade. Oh my God. Are you kidding me? I am failing biology, but I am fucking for sure getting a D because I am printing this report. And I'm going from an F to a D, baby. <laughs> and sure enough, that's what I did. I wasn't a very good kid back then. Never really applied myself. But that sure did help. Um, yeah, we then got the Packard Bell, also at Incredible Universe. It was a 166 megahertz processor. I know this because it was a huge marketing deal. It was a huge step up. All my friends prior to that had 133 megahertz. And I was able to take advantage of amazing games like this. In fact, what are the system requirements? Let's take a, a quick look at the. Can you see this? I'll, I'll show it on camera. Oh, you're not really going to be able to see too much. I'll give it a little snapshot there so maybe you can see it. Zoom in. Sorry for my shaky hands. I'm going to read it back to everyone. The recommended. I'm not going to do minimal. I'm going to do recommended. This is what they recommend for you to run Duke 3D from uh, the great old 19... See, when was this? 1995. 1996. You needed an IBM or 100% compatible 486 computer with 8 megabytes of RAM. Holy shit. You needed a VGA graphics card, all right? 25 megabytes of free space on a hard disk drive, it says. And it's, oh shit, now that was the minimum. God damn it. I'm sorry, folks. You needed a 486 DX2 66 Pentium. All right, this was the big deal. You needed a Pentium. So we got the Pentium 166 megahertz processor. You need a required uh, required for SVGA models, and you need a 16 megabytes of RAM, a VGA local bus video drive, a video card, 25 megabytes of free space, CD-ROM drive, and a sound card to take full advantage. You also needed a mouse, joystick, or gamepad. It supports VGA and SVGA uh, video options. It is supported by Sound Blaster, Ultrasound and also a few others, which I remember seeing in the options. Very fascinating. So we needed to upgrade our computer in order to run that shit. And so we went out and got the 166 megahertz Pentium processor. Thank you, Intel. And it uh, was very, very fantastic. One last little uh, funny story and tidbit about the early days of the internet. Now, my dad worked for the phone company for many, many years. In fact, he worked there pretty much his whole life, retired from there. Um, and I always thought it was interesting because we were early adopters of the internet, but we spent many years, I think probably three years, using one phone line and it fucking us all up for so long. And I remember us always saying, like, Dad, I remember one time I went to him, I'm like, Dad, this doesn't make any sense, man. Like, you work for the phone company. How the fuck do we, I mean, can we get another phone line? For, can we get a dedicated phone line? I had this bright idea, right? I'm thinking, oh, wait. Everyone's picking up the phone all the time. It's fucking us up. What if we get a dedicated phone line for the computer? Now, this was a big deal, mind you. Nowadays, they can't even sell landlines. To, like, giving them away. Like, they can't, they can't give them away. I call up my internet service provider, and I'm like, you know, man, I need to, I need to up, upgrade my internet. Well, we got, a, we got a great bundle with cable and a landline phone for you. No, I don't want it. Oh, but it's, oh, we'll throw it in for free. No, I don't want it. Look, if you want to take advantage of this deal, you have to get the landline phone. Okay, I'm walking. It's that aggressive now. They can't even get rid of them. But back then, it was a big deal. 
And most people did not have this. This was very uncommon. You kind of had to be, and again, I feel very fortunate. Uh, and it was really only because my dad did work for the phone company that we were kind of able to sucker our way as as kids sucker our way into getting a dedicated phone line but it wasn't really until my parents my dad started to use AOL and use the internet and really see its full potential he was kind of like oh yeah I'm gonna need to download those boobies too we're gonna need to get a dedicated line in this house <laughs> that really didn't happen but he started to see the value of the internet so then we did get another line a separate phone line. It had its own number. I remember we wrote the number down and I taped it on top of the modem. So I'd always remember it. There was no area codes at the time. So it was just um, seven digits, right? Wait. Yeah, seven. And uh, we, that was it. We just would dial. We would dial out. And I'd tell my friends, hey, if when you call me to play Duke on your computer, here's my number. Put it in. And you'd boo -doo 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 -doo, enter and it would dial out. So it was really fascinating. And I love that. That was really, really great. Shortly after that, Cable came into play, and it was like, what? To have it completely connected at all times? What? Because you remember, there was times when they would, in the early days, they would charge you by hour. Yes, I'm not fucking joking. This is real shit. They would charge you per hour of time. An hour equal to X amount of time for you to be on. Then, then they went to, like, monthly. Like, okay. It's going to be monthly. We'll charge you every month. It's going to be 20, 30, 40, whatever it was. We'll charge you monthly. Then they went to a, um, because then when DSL came in, it was kind of like, you're going to pay monthly and uh, it's really, really fast. And that's kind of the model that stuck, the monthly fee. So yeah, then DSL came in and everything changed. The whole world changed. We got rid of our other phone line. We had it. For, we kept it for a while to actually make calls. So when somebody was on the phone talking, we could use this phone to call and talk to other people. This was really before cell phones. But yeah, it was really, really fascinating. Good stuff. Uh, man, what a great time. So with all that being said, I'm going to now show off some of these really great games, some of my prized possession big box PC games. And before doing so, hashtag retro PC. If you want to take part, I would love, I would love to, first of all, I would love to know if you have any early PC memories, any PC gaming, would love to talk about it. You can send me a voice, voice message. We can talk about it. Send me a text. Give me a story. Let me know what are some of your memories with PC gaming. And if you want to share a photo, go to Discord. Heinehouse.com is where you can get on there, get on the Discord. And in the podcast chat, I have a, I have a room. I got an AOL room there. I should rename it AOL. I have a room there for podcast chat. Everything related to the show, you can post in there. I would love to see your pictures. Take a picture of your, your old gaming rig, maybe some big box games you have, your PC collection, and hashtag it RetroPC. And let's all go in there and just have a great community time looking at them and checking them out. I would love to talk with you guys about that, okay? First of all, this is Stephanie's seventh guest right here. Big box. This is a great game. Point and click adventure. It's very dark and um, has a lot of puzzles, but also does feature a lot of FMV, which is really, really, uh, FMV was huge in these days, way ahead of its time. So this is seventh guest. And then my brother used to play this. My brother, CJ, he loved this. He used to play it on, uh, on our Mac, our Performa, if you can believe it. Then came the sequel quite a bit later, The Eleventh Hour. Look at this beautiful thing. Isn't this nice? You know, they just don't make games like this anymore. They just don't do it. Oh, it's upside down. I'll have to fix that. But, yeah, very, very nice. I'll try not to get any glare on there for you guys. But what a great game. Ooh. Rated M for Mature. This was uh, – uh, so that had to have been post-92. What's the date on it? Do we got a date? There's a date on there somewhere. Yeah, 95, right there, 11th hour. These are great. These are hers. She loves them. She collects this stuff. Very, very cool. Here's something that is really, really fascinating. This is Road Rash, all right? And this is the CD-ROM Classics uh, edition. And what's what I like about this the most, now I have this on PC, but this one's factory sealed. How cool, right? Fast Bikes has great... Uh, Great FMV in there. Very violent. This game revolutionized so many things about racing and, and violence and kind of was the, uh, the, the epitome of, uh, of violent uh, racing video games. Windows 95. This is the CD-ROM classic, so this was not the floppy disk version. Uh, as you, you might be able to see there, there's a price tag. It says 
You see it? Five ninety nine. I paid six bucks for this. You know, there was a time when people were just blowing the stuff out of the water. They didn't want it anymore. Very uncommon game here. Probably never seen this before. This is Initial D. On PC. Big box. Very nice. Uh, Windows 98. <laughs> it says Windows 98, Windows Me, and Windows XP. Really, really cool. Uses the Havoc game engine. Value soft. So you know it's a real sign of quality. Now, this is very, uh, very uncommon. But really cool to see. Good stuff right there. Initial D. The game, the game's not that great. I opened it up, I installed it on a, a 98 box that I have, and it's just, it's not really that great. How about another racing game? You know, you, you know, you can't watch this and not have some racing games. Daytona, Sega Racing, baby. Daytona USA Deluxe Edition. This was a PC exclusive. Uh, the deluxe version of it. It had uh, upgraded textures, higher res textures. Uh, it was supposed to have a little bit better sound. Overall, it was just trying to correct all the issues that it had in the past uh, past versions, and there was a lot. This did feature LAN, as you can see at the bottom, one to eight players, which was really really nice, a lot of fun. And uh, this is actually a pretty good game. It's it's not PC uh, perfect, but it's a uh, I remember playing it. it. It did okay. It did all right. Eight-player network play over TCP IP, modem, serial link, plus chat, it says. How nice. Eight stock cars, each with unique handling. They don't handle that great. It says a direct 3D patch coming soon online, folks. Don't even trip. That direct 3D is going to happen. When I was younger, I was really into Star Wars games. I, I I didn't even bring them out. Well, actually, I brought some out. I'm going to show these off because now I'm talking about Star Wars. So let's go ahead and do it. I bought a lot of Star Wars games. I love the X-Wing series, uh, X-Wing versus TIE Fighter, Dark Forces, Rebel Assault, all these games. I bought all of them. I loved them. This one I picked up later in life. Uh, I picked this one up maybe in 2010. I found it locally here. This is uh, be a lot of glare. This is the Star Wars, ooh, Star Wars Lucas Arts Archives Volume Two. All right, this is. I mean, like, look at this cool box, amazing. So five sensational Star Wars titles. Look what's on the back of this: Dark Forces, Rebel Assault, Rebel Assault Two, and Tie Fighter. And it has an exclusive making, making of, like making the magic. It's like a basically like a dvd but you open this up look at this you open it up and it shows all the the cds that are in there all very nice laid out really beautiful like just again showing off the big box great big box stuff here very very nice but this is a great great collectible and something that um you know it's hard to get these games to run on modern systems in fact you might as well just go to good old games gog.com and and cruise there their library of Star Wars games because they have a lot on there that you can get working without having to tweak and do a bunch of stuff. Moving on with the Star Wars stuff, this was my and I've kept this forever since I was a kid. I, I just don't know why I couldn't ever I couldn't throw it away. There's just no way. Um, Rebel Assault. This is the original Rebel Assault that I picked up at Incredible Universe. And what I found fascinating, what was tough back in the day, is you would go, you'd want to buy. Um, You'd want to buy a game, but the game wasn't for Apple. It wasn't for Macintosh, right? It was only for like PC, 486, 386, right? They didn't make it. So whenever I would always be like, well, where's the... Because we had the, the Performa 450 first. So I'll always be like, well, where's the where's the Macintosh section? You know, where can I look and get a game? So we'd go over to that section. It would be very small. Well, when I walked in, look at what I fucking saw. New from Macintosh. And it's CD-ROM, bitches. It's not a floppy disk, bitches. Yeah, I'm in the money. So this is great. I can now run Star Wars Rebel Assault. And I bought it, and I had a joystick. And, man, I, I pretty much played the Canyon Run. That's the level right there at the bottom left. I played the Canyon Run. That's about as far as I could really get. It was so terrible. The control was was oh shit. The control was terrible. Look at this nice big manual. 
Look at this, a little quick key, quick start guide. Oh, yes. CD-ROM, Rebel Assault, look at that. How nice. So good. And then, of course, the, uh, the disc in there. Very, very nice. So, very cool. Wanted to show that off. Those are great games, too. You can also get Rebel Assault, I think, on PS1. You may want to check them out there. I mean, they're on PC as well. I think uh, GOG.com has them as well. Here's something I found really fascinating out in the wild. Mortal Kombat 3. I know there's a bunch of glare in here, but Mortal Kombat 3 on PC. Very interesting. Have you guys ever seen this before? This is um, obviously Williams and Midway. It was uh, distributed by uh, GT Interactive. And on the back of it, I was I kept the jewel case, even though it's all cracked and fucked up. But it says "Made in Canada." Was this a Canadian exclusive? Do you know? Because I I think it came out in in the U.S. I, I never had it on PC. I have Mortal Kombat uh, two, and I have Mortal Kombat. Uh, no, I just have two. I have two on PC, and so I don't I don't recall. But um, I should maybe try to install it, see if it works. Another something that I found out in the wild I thought was really amazing and something that I kind of uh, kind of a prized possession. I found this for a dollar ninety nine, and sure the box is kind of fucked up. It's been through hell and back, but this is the cult classic System Shock Two. What an amazing game this is! Kind of a right around like the Half Life, early Half Life days. Great storytelling, lots of great play mechanics, lots of exploration, a lot of fun. Set in another time period, another time zone, another dimension. Very, very cool. And even though the box is has seen better days, it's definitely been flattened. I'm trying my best to like keep it, keep it, you know, as, as much as possible in good shape. I'm not stacking anything on it. But how cool. Look at that beautiful box. Isn't that nice? System Shock 2 on PC. A very rare game. Another one from our good friends at EA. This is also the PC CD-ROM Classics. There was times when we had floppy disks. Games were put on like 20 or 30 floppy disks. You know, they're only 1.4 megabytes per floppy. So when we jumped up to the 700 to 800 megabyte world of CD-ROMs, that changed gaming completely. Here we are, Need for Speed High Stakes. This is, in fact, one of my favorite Need for Speed games. I love it. It plays so well. And I love the pacing of this. It's fantastic. The PC version, although I will say the PC version... It's superior in ways of textures and audio. All right, it looks better. It's got high resolution textures. It has higher quality audio. However, high stakes on PS1, that is the one you want to play. Oh my, it plays so well. The pacing is nice. The control works. Analog supported. Definitely give it give high stakes a shot if you have a PS1. I don't need to say much about this. This one here completely took over my my life my world along with yours i'm sure unreal tournament game of the year edition this is the 1999 uh, version game of the year in fact i pull this one out because um i found this one in the wild this is not the pc this is MacSoft. this is the macintosh version yes very uncommon you wouldn't really know the boxes look identical all right except for the fact that this is MacSoft on the back and it has macintosh system requirements uh, on the on the back a mac it needs a either power pc or mac g3 processor 96 megabytes of ram it needs mac os 8.0 or higher a rage pro or better 3d card 120 megabytes hard disk space and a cd rom drive works on imac oh my gosh i'm going to zoom in on this can you see this picture oh, where are we at Works on iMac. Look at that. Stop my arm from shaking. How cool. Isn't that cool? Really, I figured you guys would like to see that. Lastly, coming into the home stretch, Wing Commander 3, Heart of the Tiger. I love the Wing Commander series, and I collect them on PC. Heart of the Tiger, probably my favorite. I love this one a lot. Um... Yeah, I mean, they're all so good, but I love this. Mark Hamill, obviously featured. A lot of great actors and actresses in here. Huge cast. Chris Roberts, still making games to this day. All right, look him up. You want a history on gaming and ambitious gaming? Look up Chris Roberts. This guy is the real deal. He's fantastic. Very big games. 
I got Half-Life 2 there. I'll show at the end. Got the Serious Sam, second encounter. Stephanie loves Serious Sam. Ah, with the people chasing you with the bombs. Always scares the absolute shit out of me. But look at this. I found this in the wild. This has a Comp USA, uh, Comp USA sticker on it, dating uh, 4 5 2012. So not too old, but I did find this at the Goodwill for a couple bucks. This is a great, great multiplayer game. Run and gun shooting madness. Feel like uh, feel like Quake uh, style of gaming, or just like over the top, ridiculous. This is the one you want. Super fun. I know you guys already saw it. This is my Duke 3D. This one has the mouse pad inside, which I still have, and I used for years. It's all faded and fucked up, but I still have it. I love it. Good old Duke 3D. See, I was t I was saying when I was telling my story about, it, I'm like, look at the box art. It's got it's got the girl there. It says censored. You're like at a strip club and there's shit blowing up everywhere. And man, come on, dude. When you're a kid and you see this shit, you're like, I gotta have it. I gotta have this. Duke Nukem 3D. Change my change my world. Change the face of gaming forever. And I really wanted this 10 network. Total entertainment network. This was something that was released by them, and it was an, a, you, a, a monthly subscription. You paid for it, and you could play online with people. And I never got it. I never had it. I wanted it. I fought for it, and uh, I just never got it. And thankfully, I didn't because it didn't do very well and died pretty quick. And then DSL came into the picture, and then we were always connected. There was no need to pay for that shit. So very fascinating. Lastly, before we wrap up the show, folks, I'm going to close it on my grand finale, something that I'm really, really proud of. These are all of my original Half-Life 2 um, they didn't release them in the big, big box. It's kind of like a uh, medium-sized box. But how cool is this? We got Gordon Freeman right there. We have uh, the Alex Vance. Her and her sexy ass. And then we have Gordon Freeman, the G-Man, right here, the G-Man. So I've got all three of these, and they are just so beautiful. So beautiful. Love them. Hopefully you can see them all. Kind of a nice collection. I, lo I love Half-Life 2. One of my favorite first-person shooters of all time. Great. Incredible. Not just great. Amazing. Incredible storytelling. Incredible gameplay. Valve changed the face. They didn't just change like the shooter genre or the video game world. They changed how people make games after that. Every developer in the world was looking at their games going, holy shit, our game sucks compared to that. We really need to step this shit up. We need to hire writers. We need to get teams of people to know what they're doing. We need to create a game engine that is unique and dynamic. They can take fucking boxes and move them around and interact and destroy them. And you can take a crowbar and break windows and it shatters. And it's, it's, it's like you're really there. I mean, it, it sounds so crazy when I talk about it now. But it changed, it changed everything. Absolutely changed everything. So there's some PC gaming uh, uh, big box stuff for you there. I'm so, so happy that uh, I was able to share some of that stuff with you guys. I love it. Absolutely love it. Okay, I'm going to move on. We're going to answer some questions. I got some questions here uh, from the community in Discord. And then I also have a few audio questions. How about we just jump right into it? Let me load up my Discord here. <clears throat> and again, heinyhouse.com at the very top of the web page. You want to go ahead and click on that thing. There's a big Discord logo up there. That's how you get involved. And I'm, I'm pulling this right here from our pad, padcast. <laughs> I'm thinking of pad tie. My podcast chat section in Discord. Uh, we've got uh, Mr. Hambone81 uh, asked this today, actually. He asked a question with how amazing Mario Maker is. I'm so excited. He's so excited for it on the Switch, by the way. But the question is, what other franchise would you like to see do the same? Zelda, Mario, Mario Kart, um, Garbage Town quickly answered after that. He said Mega Man, 100%. I think creating levels in Mega Man would be amazing. But I think creating levels in Mario Kart, in the Mario Kart world, in that ecosystem would be unbelievable. Think about when you play Mario Kart on Switch right now. And the levels are so intricate they're so detailed they're so 
Beautiful. Wouldn't it be amazing to go in and actually create your own tracks and race them and then submit them online and have people download them and then everyone's racing in there? You can create some crazy, crazy custom courses. I think it's a missed opportunity. And I'm telling you, Mr. Hambone, that's a great question because I agree completely. I think we need to have Mario Kart in there. I think one of the most exciting things that I really, really enjoyed, and I know it sounds... It's, I know it's primitive or whatever, but on Excite Bike on NES, when you could create your own track and then race it, do you guys remember that? I still do that when I play that game. I'll play the game, I'll play the courses. Then when before I'm done, I'm like, I gotta create some tracks. I'll go create a few, race them, just have fun. It's just a fun novelty, and it adds. It's a connection. It's a nice connection to you in the game, and I think it brings out something special. Yes, I would absolutely love it. Um, yes, fantastic stuff. Um, I want to say uh, shout out to Jim. Also in Discord, last episode he posted the Packard Belt Navigator living room. Go in there and check it out. This is amazing. Uh, he had a Packard Belt as well, so he had a connection there with me. Um, it would actually show the programs you had installed. It looks like your typical '90s living room with uh, the 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 phone. It's got a fax machine, the answering machine, the huge TV, all this stuff. But it was really kind of like a. Uh, a living room, a navigator living room where you could see all of your items and click and launch programs and do all that stuff on Packard Bell. Wow. That is pretty fascinating. So if you want to see that, it's in Discord. Go check it out. <laughs> I love it. I would love to see your PC gaming stuff. Again, guys, hashtag retro PC. Get in Discord. Pop them in. Let's see it. All right, my man, Jim. He's got an audio question. I appreciate sending it over. Let's go and take a look here. Take a listen if it loads it. There we go. Hi, Jason. Thanks a lot for the podcast. It's great entertainment. This is Jim from Iowa, and I was wondering if you had any suggestions or tips for cable management. When you start adding more and more electronics to the mix, you inevitably start creating a rat's nest of cables. What tactics and tools do you use to keep cables organized? Thank you much. Jim, thank you so much for the audio question. That is a great question and something that any uh, gamer, this isn't just audio related, anything gamer related, if you have a lot of consoles in your game room, you're running cables like crazy. Um, Now, I try... I don't even want to show stuff back here. I I really try to keep cables tight and and, uh, placed very neatly, if possible. The problem that I run into, though, is that because I... This is a fully... Any place I... I make home of my studio. It's a fully working studio. So I need to move things. I need to adjust. I need to reroute signal here or there. So it's a it's a balancing act for me between having cables that are loose and able to be pulled up and moved or cables that are stationary that will not move. For instance, power supplies, um, IEC cables, uh, any dedicated audio cables, XLR cables, if they're going to a specific microphone or mixer or something, anything like that, you have your two, your two types. Needs to move, doesn't need to move. If it doesn't need to move, tie it down. I will tell you what I, one thing I use is the Velcro zip ties. Uh, or the Velcro cable ties, rather. And those things are a lifesaver, godsend lifesaver. Um, you can find them on Amazon. They're sold in packs, I think, of 100 or 50. It's just a little plastic little plastic box. You should go look on there. Um, those, I mean, I have everything wired up, and I have everything tied up with those. Um, I can't I can't show you that one because, again, I have it tied up. I can't pull it out. But, uh, yeah, man, those Velcro ties, those really help out. Um Another thing that you can do is, I know there's a lot of like uh, companies that sell, um, I don't want to say like it's it's gimmicks, but I mean, they do sell lots of um, cable tie, like management um, adapters or not adapters, but they're more or less like devices, like pieces of almost furniture to like put your cables in and tuck them and hide them. And I think all that stuff is really great too. I know Ikea makes one that you can hang off a table and it runs underneath. I think that's really brilliant too, to keep the cables off the tables and hidden, but, um, just good old fashioned Velcro cable ties have saved my ass. I used to use rubber bands. I realized after moving to Arizona, the heat and rubber bands, they don't like it. Same thing with cold. 
Rubber bands just do not last. Stop using rubber bands. If you're using them now, go take all of them off. Get rid of them. If they haven't already shit themselves and are all brittle and broken, get rid of them and put Velcro cable ties on there. I then used to use um, the ouchless. I know this is crazy. I used to use the ouchless hair ties that uh, women would buy and put in their hair, the little um, elastic black cable or um, hair ties. And I used to buy those like in bulk, like going out of style. I'd have a box of them. Those lose elasticity after 10 years or so. So it's not really um, a good option. And I found that out after about 10 years going back to my cables or my game controllers or my consoles, power supplies and looking at them and saying, Oh Jesus! Look at all this stuff. It's 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 broken. They're just they, there's no elasticity. It's like the cable ties. You know the hair ties are like this, but then now they're just huge and they're they're broken. So, Velcro cable ties. That's that's really the best way that you're going to uh, you're going to get your cable management under control. Great question, Jim. Thanks for joining in on Discord and thank you for taking a part in the audio question. My very first audio question. I'm very, very happy with that. Uh, now, I wanted to, I had, let's see, I had an email. Shit, did I not have it queued up here? Just give me a moment here. Uh, let me uh, let me take five. Let me take five. I'm going to queue this up and get my emails up here because I had another audio question and a text question in the form of uh, email. So go and just give me a second. I'm going to queue some, I'm going to try it here live on the spot. I'm going to queue the other cam. I'm going to set up my email and get in there, and we'll go from there. Be right back. Welcome to Heidi. Oh, hey, hey, how about I get that one? Okay, yeah, got it up here. All right, moving right along. Thank you for waiting, folks. Appreciate that. All right, next up, got my email. Sorry, I didn't have it set up before. We're doing this shit on the fly. Audio question from my brother, Kyle. Yeah, uh, I was calling or doing a voice record for a segment in your uh, your podcast. I talked about the part of... Uh, we're talking about your PC experience or your PC story, man. Oh, you'll love it. We have so many uh, stories. I don't even know where to begin. Um, but I could only, I can always just, uh, just a quick one. Just, you can never fail. Do a little DOD, Dave Defeat, you know, uh, the Shashitz, uh, <laughs> get the Gone launch, and uh, just everybody getting together, teaming up, playing till the wee hours of the morning. No doubt. Oh uh, shit, we would play that. Uh, I, I don't know. There was, I think it was a winter break, and I, it almost felt like we played it for two weeks straight, <laughs> day and night. I don't know if you remember that, Jason, but Hell yeah. I think we played it all night and all day for two weeks. I mean, it was my Christmas break, and then all of a sudden we had that snowstorm, and uh, it just, <laughs> it was nothing but DOD. I mean, it was, uh, I used to go out to play in the snow, but it was, no, let's play DOD. Yeah, we didn't even fuck with the snow. And it just, uh, I mean, there's so many. I mean, we used to play racing games. I mean, shit, I don't even know where to begin. Yes, yes. Maybe you could elaborate a little bit more on it, what I'm trying to say. But, oh, yeah. Uh, you could start there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. This is awesome, dude. I'm going to be watching. I'm so proud of you, and this is amazing. Thanks, bro. Thank you, Kyle. That's my brother right there. Shout out to my brother, Kyle. Thank you for the audio question. Yes, and in fact, you probably really... I've already enjoyed this episode a lot, talking about the early days of the internet, talking about the gaming and showing off some of these some of these big box games. 100%, man, Day of Defeat, I think that game single-handedly kind of changed our life when it came to online gaming. We played that so much. Day of Defeat was a mod uh, from uh, 
Counter Strike 1.6. You know, Counter Strike was um, a great competitive online. A shooter that was done by Valve based off of the Half-Life, original Half-Life game engine. And Dave Defeat was kind of a, a mod off of that in World War II. So, uh, yeah, we, we played that. I mean, I got so many people involved in that game, even people who never had gaming experience or, or gaming PC. They would buy PCs just to game with us and do that. I mean, we 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 did a lot. Another one, Unreal Tournament 99. I, you know, I showed it earlier. You remember we played that so much with with the whole crew, Brady and Wes and all those all the people from back in the day. So amazing stuff, Kyle. Incredible memories. I'm so glad you remember that, and I hope that you hold on to those memories forever. I obviously certainly do. And we didn't even fuck with the snow. We were like. You know, it, it snows in Oregon once every 10 years, but that one year it snowed, we we're like, nah, fuck it. Let's just stay inside and play Dave Defeat. Amazing stuff. I love it. Thank you so much for the question. Great memory, and I'm really happy that you shared it with all of us. Thank you for that. Um, and we have just a final question here. Uh, came through via email from Mr. Joe Martinez. Joe, thank you for writing in. appreciate that. Says, hey, Jason, love the show. You were talking about things you didn't like about the Switch. Sometimes I noticed that my left Joy-Con would cause my character to start walking to the left by himself without me even touching it. In the past, have you ever had any issues with analog drift? Under quotes. For any of your controllers? If so, how did you handle it? Keep up the good work. Thank you, Joe, for the question. Man, you guys are killing it with the great, great questions. This is fantastic. In fact, Joe, yes. I have had lots of issues with analog drift. Nothing on the Joy-Cons, personally. However, this is funny you bring this up. Last week, we were at Target, and we just walk around Target just to window shop and just fuck around and play with toys and look at stuff. We were in, in Target, and they had Toad's uh, – what's that game from Toad? Toad's Adventure or something or other. And, you know, they have the demo kiosk for the Switch. That – and that particular kiosk, and of course, everyone uses the controllers. They destroy them. They fuck them up. Toad was walking left, hard left, just into a wall, just. Ch -ch 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 -ch. And I grabbed the Joy-Con and I tried to push him to the right and fix it. Wouldn't fix. The the obviously the the joystick was broken, and so it had worn out already. This is a serious problem. You already know. I talked about my Joy Cons and how I think they're fucked up, and I don't really like them too much. This is going to be a massive issue for Nintendo. They're kind of loose to begin with, so. And I know Nintendo makes a, a great product, very high quality product, but we are going to have serious issues down the road with their joysticks going out, and I feel really bad for it. Have I had any issues with other controllers in this? Yes, absolutely, man. N64, uh, I've been N64 has been probably one of the notorious ones, the first ones to really come out with a true analog joystick in plastic form. Um, I have replaced a lot of my N64 joysticks. I a long time ago, maybe 15 years ago, I bought on eBay a new old stock box of like um, probably 30 or 25 or 30 Nintendo joysticks. If you can believe it, somebody was selling them. And I bought the lot and I would replace all the joysticks on my N64 controllers uh, that were going out. And most of you, you may not know, but I'll, I'll I'll let you know here is that I love the N64. I, in fact, uh, I've been collecting N64 uh, back when you could still buy them in the store. So I have a I have a complete set of N64 Fantastic, uh, all in rental cases. Maybe I'll show it sometime for you guys if you really want, want to see that sort of thing. Maybe when we do an N64 episode, I'll show them off. Um, but I love that console. So I replaced a lot of my joysticks that were going out. Now, you can also get the Hori Mini Pad. That is a great controller. However, you have to import it. And you're going to have to pay at least probably $80 to $150 anywhere in there to do that. You'd almost be better off buying a Retro Fighters controller and playing the N64 or any of, you know, Retro Fighters. I haven't had a controller from them yet. I did back their Dreamcast once. So hopefully we'll see how their analog sticks are from there. If you have any experience with Retro Fighters, if you guys backed their early uh, controllers or have some, let me know what you think. Um, but other than that, uh, the long-winded answer here. To answer your question, um, yeah, man. I mean, my Xbox 360 controller, my Wired 360 controller that I used for like uh, six years uh, would drift so bad on racing games that I couldn't... There was no... The dead zone, I had to make the dead zone so big that it would affect my driving. So you have to just 
you have to, uh, what my dad says, you know, just cut bait, you know, cut bait and move on from it. So I uh, got another one. Um, and uh, so I'm using that. I love the wired 360 controller for PC gaming. It's very, very good. Um, you either have to replace the joysticks themselves, take apart the controller and replace the innards, or you have to just buy another controller. Depends on your level of uh, uh, techiness and uh, your expertise level if you want to attempt that, if you feel confident. Uh, if not, just buy another controller. But I feel bad that you have an issue with your Joy-Cons. That's fucked up. Um, I hope that Nintendo maybe addresses these down the road and that it can get under control and that Man, I can already see it. We don't want to have be, be having all these issues with Joy-Con controllers fucking up down the road. Man, that's going to be a rough one. Um, anyway, folks, hey, hashtag RetroPC. Hit us up in Discord. I'd love to see your pictures. I would love to hear your audio questions. HeineHouse at gmail.com. Send them on over. Thanks to everyone for participating. Uh, and thanks to all the, the people that are new people joining in on Discord. I love you guys. It's so good to see you interacting in there. Um, and I, I, I actually, I just applied to have the Discord server um, be authenticated and official. So hopefully if we can get enough traction going on in there and enough people posting and engaging, uh, Discord will approve it, um, which really helps. It helps that it gives me backing from Discord to keep the spam out. Um, and I have great security measures in place for that. So I, I really want that. I want that to be a thriving and great community for all of us to have a safe place to come and have fun and discuss uh, gaming and tech and just kick back and have fun and meet new people, play games, talk the shit, have a good time. You know, it's what it's all about. So again, um, all the links are coming in my outro, but HeineHouse.com, check it all out. You guys, much love. Episode three in the bag. You guys rock. We will catch you another time. Thank you so much for listening. Goodbye now. That's all for this episode of Heine House Live. Thank you all so much for being here. This podcast is directly supported and funded by your generous pledges given on Patreon. You know, and if you're sitting there like, hey, you know, thanks, Jay. I appreciate that. You know, I had a good time. You know, this was a good date. We had a, we had a nice, nice sesh here. Maybe he had a little giggle. You know, maybe he had a little tickle. You know, if you felt a little something, something, had a good laugh, cracked a little smile, you know, swing on by Patreon. Just come on in. You don't even need reservations. It's, it's always open for you, ready to go. Just come on by. Got a bunch of exclusive content, music, all kinds of stuff there for you. And of course, how about social media? If you're on the interwebs, maybe you're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, you can find me at handle at Heine House. And lastly, of course, audio questions. Please get those going. Get on the horn. You know, get on the the bullhorn. Maybe you want to get on the string and cup. And maybe you got a talk boy. Maybe you want to submit that to me via talk boy. That would be fantastic. Bust out the cassettes. Submit those audio questions via email. HeineHouseLive at gmail.com. And of course, the real-time community chat can be found in our Discord server where the party never ends. It continues all night long. HeineHouse.com. See y'all in the next one. Bye now.